Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Kato. Ki te mana whinua o Tini Takiwa, Naitu Ahuriri, me Naitahu Fanui. Ke te mihi, ke te mihi, ke te mihi. Ko Jessica Halliday toko ingoa, ko aho te kai whakahaere o te Putahi, Centre for Architecture and City Making. Kia ora, tato, katoa. It's my pleasure to briefly welcome you all, those in the room and those joining us online, to can we have a clean, can we have clean, cheap, reliable energy? The third event in this Christchurch Conversations Towards 2030 series. This event series considers the ways in which we can meet this city's emissions reduction goals. It's always good in an event like this to remember the why. When Joseph Hullen opened the first event in this series earlier this year, he used the very well-known Naitahu Whakatauki, Mō tato a mō ka uri a muri aki nei, for us and our children after us. That is really what gathers us together. This Whakatauki reminds us why this topic matters. There are two groups of people that we would very much like to thank, who have made today's event possible. Um, firstly, our supporters and our sponsors. Our series partner, Christchurch City Council, our series sponsor, the It's Time Canterbury Climate Campaign, and our re research partner, the Huritanga thread of building better homes, towns and cities, one of the National Science Challenges. The others who have made tonight's event possible are our six esteemed speakers who will address this vital topic for climate action, clean, cheap, reliable energy. Now those who follow me on this stage will more formally welcome and introduce you to our speakers, but I would like to thank our speakers for accepting our invitation to speak and help us all better understand the complexities, opportunities and urgency of decarbonising our energy system. Those of you in the room hopefully have found your It's Time Canterbury GAT cards on your seats. If you're, and Michelle's holding them up, um, if you're online, please look in the comments for further information. Uh, this card is a way for you to state what you think is the top thing this region could do to reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions from energy. Uh, so please use the card to record what's inspired you from the event and then you can post it online and you can also leave it with us at the end. Tonight, you can ask pa uh, questions of the panel by texting your question. So please text your question to this number. Um, this number will also be on the screen during the panel discussion. If you've joined us online, you're welcome to leave your question as a comment on the live stream on YouTube. We'll endeavour to do our best to get to as many questions as we can. I would not li now like to hand over to Councillor Sarah Templeton to provide a formal welcome to this whare, to Honanga and to the event. Thank you. Ki na maunga, ki na awa, ki na waka, ki na tātai tangata. Nā te rea o mihi kia koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou katoa kua hui mai nei ki tēnei whare, ki tēnei whare te hononga. Uh, ki te kōrero nā whakaaro, tēnā koutou e ake rangatera, Megan Woods. Uh, kia ora. Ko Sarah Templeton tōko ingoa, no ingarani o kutipuna, ke te noho o ki o tūtahi. So welcome everyone to te hononga our City Council officers for this evening's Christchurch conversation on energy and its importance as we work towards our net carbon neutral goals. Welcome especially to Minister Woods and I had heard Minister uh, MP Eugenie Sage was um, coming along as well. Yep. Uh, and to our other speakers this evening, I am really looking forward to the conversations. Te Hononga is what I'd like to call an upcycled building and many will know it as the old post office it was the first renovated building in the country and only the second building overall to achieve a six green star rating when it opened in 2010. And New Zealand first innovation for Te Hononga is the tri-generation plant. This enables the building to generate its own electricity, heating and cooling from biogas. This is piped from the council's Burwood landfill site and converted into electricity. 
The heat from this process is used both to heat and then by a process of heat conversion, cool the building. As we look to new energy sources across the country, we must also look to cut energy use overall. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from our speakers this evening about the many and varied ways that we can achieve our goals when we put our collective will to it. Norera tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Kia ora koutou. So how are we going to roll this evening? Well, first of all, there'll be a series of presentations and then we'll have a short discussion with our Christchurch-based speakers. So if you have a question, just text it to that number or you can comment in the live stream if you are online at the moment and I will put that up again when we get to the discussion. So we've got a packed program, so we'll be keeping the introductions snappy uh, cell phones on silent if you can, but if you hear a soothing chime towards the end of someone's presentation, it's not that someone in the room is about to be shamed, it's our speaker's one minute mark. Tonight's Christchurch conversation is about energy. Why energy? Well, because the largest single contributor to human-induced climate change is carbon dioxide and a fraction of other greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels. That is the climate change bottom line. We must free ourselves from reliance on fossil fuels. And that comes down to what energy we use to power our lives. Just specifically, petrol and diesel to power our cars, utes and trucks. Coal and gas for process heat in our dairy factories, glass houses, school boilers, coal and gas, to produce the electricity we use to run our lights, stoves, heat pumps, TVs, showers and teenagers, gaming computers, all at the same time in the evenings, in winter, especially in dry years. In effect, in future, our entire city will become a zero emission zone. So I'd like to start with the big picture, and for that we have invited Dr Jan Wright to talk about decarbonising New Zealand's energy system. So Jan was the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment from 2007 to 2017, and it is hard to think of a more esteemed Christchurch resident to start this climate conversation. Jan, if you'd like to come up to the lectern. I just add, by the way, that Jan actually, amongst her many qualifications, has a Master's in Energy and Resources from Berkeley. Um, so she really, really, really knows what she's talking about. <laughs> I seem to have tripped over my microphone here anyway. Um, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak and kia ora to all, of, all the people who are out there in the ether. Um, huge topic, 20 minutes, um, here goes. I want to make six um, high-level points that are all pretty basic, and I'm going to have to go at a fairly fast clip, so uh, try to keep up with me. I hope I'm keeping it simple. Um, number one, number one point. Think carbon, not renewable energy. Renewable energy is not necessarily the same as low carbon. This might sound trivial, but it's essential to put your carbon glasses on if you're going to think clearly. The renewable good, non-renewable bad idea is an artefact of the 1970s when OPEC was on the rise and the world we all thought the world was running out of oil and I'm old enough to remember I was there. The idea was then that sources of energy that were renewable but could be renewed would not run out and so that's what we were after. But it's not the 1970s anymore. We are not running out of energy. For a start, we have heaps of coal in the Earth's crust that could keep us going for hundreds of years. What we're running out of is the ability of the atmosphere to absorb greenhouse gases and keep the climate stable. So renewability is not the point. It's not difficult to think of energy projects, renewable energy projects that have high carbon footprints. Some biofuels can easily fall into this category. In the Resource Management Act, the RMA, geothermal energy is classed as renewable, but two of our geothermal power plants are worse than gas power plants for emitting CO2. So and on the other hand, non-renewable 
most forms of energy are not equally evil. Coal is much worse than gas. Numbers matter. That's the bottom line for me. Numbers matter. And for this reason, because renewable energy and low carbon are not necessarily the same thing, I feel that the government's goal of 100% renewable electricity by 2030 misses the point. That was my first point. Think carbon, not renewable. Second point, think demand first, supply later. Think about reducing demand first, and then, once you've done that, think about increasing supply. So demand, energy consumption, how can we reduce it? How can we use energy more efficiently? How can we shift demand to times when the fossil fuel power plants are unlikely to be generating? New Zealand has slowly got better at this. I was delighted to hear that one of our speakers is going to be talking about LED light bulbs today. In my book, and you've all got one, it's great. In my book, LED light bulbs um, get a double tick. A tick for how much energy they save, they use far less electricity than other light bulbs, and a second tick for when that energy is saved, when that electricity is saved, because LED light bulbs save electricity on dark winter mornings and evenings when the electricity system is running hard and Huntley and the gas power plants are most likely to be spewing out carbon dioxide. Sorry about spewing, that was a bit casual. Um, <laughs> LED light bulbs are a no-brainer for reducing demand because they save carbon-intensive electricity, and by the way, they last longer. So demand first, supply later. My third point is a whole lot more electricity. So, so let's start thinking about supply. We will need a whole lot more electricity for our supply. Our task is to greatly reduce the use of fossil fuels, as we've heard already, coal, gas, and oil. And as an aside, remember all the time, coal is the greatest villain here. But what do we replace coal and oil and gas with? Well, you might say biofuels. I do expect an increasing role for solid biofuels in New Zealand, wood pellets. But liquid and gas biofuels should be reserved for high-priority specialist users, where other things won't do, for powering aeroplanes, for example, and in an industry where electricity won't do it, such as processes that need a flame. Solar heat helps, using the sun to heat water directly in passive solar design of buildings, of course. What about hydrogen? I don't see it as a game changer for New Zealand, though maybe more so in the long term. But electricity, of course, is needed to produce green hydrogen, so it doesn't get us away from electricity. So fundamentally, we will need a whole lot more electricity, electricity generation and a whole lot more transmission to get it to where it is needed around the country. As Jessica said, Oh, no, she didn't say. She was meant to say this in the introduction. <laughs> so trouble, we'd start reading your notes. Um, you cut down the introduction. And it wasn't Jessica anyway. Um, I was a member of the Interim Climate Change Committee, which was the precursor to the Climate Change Commission. Our big conclusion, after months of detailed modelling, was simple. We're going to need a whole lot more electricity for electrifying transport and for heating in industrial processes. And focusing on this would give greater reductions in carbon dioxide than focusing on making all our electricity renewable. We called our report Accelerated Electricity, and presumably you can still find it on the internet. So that was my third point, a whole lot more electricity. Fourth point, electricity must be cheap, or relatively so. Otherwise, there will be little incentive to switch from fossil fuel, particularly for electrifying industry. The emissions trading scheme will help with this. But we have a problem. The generators want high electricity prices, and so does the government, at least with one of its hats on, because it is a major shareholder in three of the big five, Meridian, Genesis, and Mercury. Electricity is a big revenue earner for the government. But of course, with other hats on, the government wants electricity to be cheap, so it's not easy. Big question, what do we do to make the wholesale electricity market and the electricity sector more generally help take us to carbon zero. I don't believe it is at the moment. And it's not clear what would be better. I'm not suggesting what the reform should be, and I don't think we should rush, because we haven't got a great history of reforms in the sector. So that was electricity must be not only a whole lot more, but it must be cheap. Right, number five, the problem of storage. We need to, we're going to need to store electricity. Energy demand varies. We need to store in times of low demand to meet times of high demand. We currently store it through our hydro dams, through stockpiles of coal, 
and through moderating flows of gas. The mismatch between supply and demand is generally greatest in winter. In winter, demand is highest. But unfortunately, in winter, the inflows to the southern hydro lakes are, lo are the lowest. In winter, the wind doesn't blow as much. In winter, the sun doesn't shine as much, or for as long as it does in summer because days are shorter. Batteries can be used to deal with short-term peaks in demand. They'll get us from, from day to night and a bit more, but batteries will not get us from summer to winter. Such batteries would be physically feasible, but impossibly expensive. And that's why the Interim Climate Change Committee, of which I was a member, recommend that government look at the pumped hydro scheme in Onslow in central Otago. Such a scheme would be, in effect, a giant battery, and some of you will, see, will have seen the article about it in a recent listener. The idea is to dam Lake Onslow and drill a tunnel down to the Clutha River when electricity is cheap and emissions are low, which is the same time. Water would be pumped up into the lake. The middle of the night's good for that. Then the water can be run down through the tunnel to generate electricity when it is needed. The government is investigating Onslow and other options in its New Zealand battery project. I'm not saying it's the answer there, I'm just saying it's really good it's being investigated. But I am picking that the big generators will hate the idea, already in over there, because it would make all their assets worth less. When there's plenty of water in Onslow, it could be used to reduce the price that everyone gets. Okay, that was, that was a problem of storage. Uh, number six, the Resource Management Act and trade-offs, the RMA and whatever is to replace it. We believe there's something coming at some point. The RMA does not mention climate change. It gives no guidance on how to deal with trade-offs between reducing greenhouse gases and other environmental goods. I remember Nick Smith saying how hard it is to get consents for renewable power plants. And in a way, this isn't surprising. Renewable power plants spread a net to catch, capture natural en energy flows, whether they be flowing water wind turbines across a landscape, or in the future, maybe solar ranches, as the Americans call them. But a gas power plant is nice and tidy, and apart from sending carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, has a small environmental footprint. We can see the problem very clearly with wind farms. They attract heaps of objections, although they do no permanent damage, which is a bottom line for me. New Zealand has the best wind in the world. I was told that by a Danish engineer when we were standing on top of one of the west wind turbines in Wellington. I remember it clearly, even though I was slightly terrified at the time. When the Interim Climate Change Committee did its detailed modelling of the electricity sector out to 2035, most of the new power plants envisaged in the model were wind. Many of them already consented, but there are time limits on those consents and some would have already lapsed. And hydro schemes are now seen differently from what they were. We're beginning to protect iwi Māori rights and interests in fresh water and setting stricter limits on minimum flows to protect or restore the ecology of rivers. I find it rather ironic that the modern conservation movement began with opposition to a renewable energy project. I'm talking about Manapuri. We know that reducing greenhouse gases is urgent, but urgency is not the defining characteristic of RMA processes. So, in summary... Number one, think carbon, not renewability. Number two, think reducing demand first, not increasing supply. Number three, when you do start thinking about increasing supply, a whole lot more electricity generation and transmission. Don't forget the transmission, that's going to get a lot of objections. Fourthly, electricity must be cheap, otherwise people won't switch to it. Fifthly, we've got to go and have the problem of storage is going to get bigger because renewable energy sources are intermittent. So the problem of storage is, is a big one. And finally, the RMA and the challenging trade-offs we're going to see there. And I thought I would end with a little story. So no one's pinged me yet, so I'm probably well within time, right? Um, to, sh to show you how none of this is easy and how firmly it is embedded in our culture. Last week, I gave a talk on climate change to um, a whole lot of men. The women made the tea. Um, and... At the end of it, they presented me with a bottle of wine and an envelope. And when I took the envelope home and opened it, I found there was a whole lot of petrol vouchers. So <laughs> that, that is sort of, in a way, a perfect illustration of how firmly all of this is embedded in our culture. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Jen. Ryan, would you like to make your way up? So I'd like to introduce Ryan Kugelein. He's Strategic Development Manager for Meridian Energy. He's going to look at how will climate change affect electricity supply and demand. And Ryan has um, a 15-year background in the energy industry and is originally from Hawke's Bay. We won't hold that against him because he says he loves Canterbury now and is going to live here forever. <laughs> if, if you'll let me stay. <laughs> um, th thanks, Michelle. Um, I think I've got to find this, right. So it's a pretty big question to answer in just a few slides, but it is a really important one if we're going to be serious about our response to climate change. Um, I can assure you I won't answer it entirely, but hopefully I can give a bit of information that kind of helps the conversation and helps to touch on a few of Jan's points too, to kind of outline the real challenges ahead if we're going to make a difference, not just on renewables, but on carbon. Um, electricity is going to need to play a significant role in decarb. It's going to need a huge shift in scale, which we'll talk about in a bit of detail. Um, the good news is that we've got a real renewable resource advantage in New Zealand, um, and new technologies are increasingly available. Um, also, I want to start by saying that my, my work in the energy industry has predominantly been transport and commercial industry, so having seen a lot of the challenges of this up close, um, I think what I've seen is that it always works best when it's cooperation and collaboration across fuels, across technologies. It's often this and this and this, not this or this, and that's that's something industry's got to do less of um, if we're going to make change at the pace that's needed. Um, on that note, I also want to say up front, electricity is not the only answer. Despite the logo on the screen, that is not what I'm here to make the case for, right? Uh, it's a big challenge with many answers, and they all need to happen at once. Um, so I'm going to break it into two parts. I'm going to look at the high-level system challenge, and then have a look at a, an example that's real, live, and happening right now. Right, so if we start with demand, because I don't think Jan mentioned it, that's the place to start. Um, and we're going to look at the demand growth ahead for the system out to 2050. Um, so today, on the left-hand side for you there, in the grey box, we're about 43 terawatt hours a year of demand. Um, and then we've got a group of existing demand resources as you move across to the right. Um, and you can see those light green boxes there. Those are really important. Efficiency first. So the best decarbonisation is the energy that we don't use. So we need to always do that first. Um, and then if you move further to the right, we start to get into sectors where decarb efforts will create new electricity demand. So you're talking about your industrial heats, your light fleets, the things that we can do now in a lot of cases. And then further right, you go harder to abate, processes that need flames, that sort of thing. So it's getting more and more difficult. It's going to require more and more I suppose, specialist innovation to make it happen. So even without factoring in those really hard to abate sectors on the far right, we get to around about a demand of about 75 terawatt hours by 2050. Um, so you can do the maths pretty quickly. You're talking about 30 terawatt hours. You're talking about things like doubling the New Zealand energy system. That's without taking into account timing and a lot of other things, right? But broadly, that's a really big challenge. Um, to put it into context, all of New Zealand's wind today generates around 2.2 terawatt hours per annum. So you think about that for a second. Manapuri is around 5 terawatt hours per annum. Um, but if we're feeling like we're in the wallow a little bit there, Japan's problem on this, on, of this is 130 times the New Zealand scale. Um, they're heavily reliant on coal and they've removed nuclear after Fukushima. So it's a big challenge. Um, and it's a case of this and that. We need generation investment to keep going, even alongside Onslow's and the like. So if we flip over to supply, um, the good news is New Zealand has an abundance of renewable energy resources. Um, they're spread around the country, which is good for a population that's spread around the country. Um, and we can identify at least 50 terawatt hours of, of what we call cost-effective new renewable generation options without having to rely on less tested technologies. So hopefully there's some upside there in the future as well. Um, the real challenge in getting these to turn up in recent years, and Jan mentioned we've seen consent laps and that sort of thing, has been what we call sort of chronic TY uncertainty, um, slowing investment. So we need that certainty for that investment to turn up. If we don't know and we've got the TY shadow hanging over us, um, certainly affects, affects Meridian in a big way, um, things just don't happen. And, I don't think that's what any of us wants to hear. Um, and I think it's worth saying too, Onslow, we say it's like part of what should be a, could be a really good answer for New Zealand. It's absolutely something we should be looking at. 
Um, you know, certainly we're not running in, running in fear from it. We're going, hey, look, we're all trying to get to the same place in 2050. We need a whole lot of generation as well. This is a big problem. It's not worth fighting each other back here in 2021 and then looking around wondering whose fault it is in 2050 when we haven't got there. So you also know that many of these options are only as good as the weather. So you might be going, what's climate change going to do to wind, water, sun as generation options? Uh, one of the small silver linings is that it puts climate change and higher temperatures actually put more energy in the global weather system. Um, for us, in terms of supply, that actually means less snow, uh, more summer inflows, more winter rain, and it'll be broadly windier in New Zealand. So there is some, I don't like even like to call it a silver lining, but there's something in it there. It also changes that curve that Jan alluded to around the timing and the seasonality. We're going to see less summer inflows and more generation capacity in the winter through South Island Hydro in particular. So the resources exist somehow. You know, there's, some, there's enough there to, to get positive about it, but what's the cost? So start, start on the left there. It's a little bit of a busy slide, but the good news is the cheapest sources of new generation in New Zealand are renewable and lower carbon. So you're talking about onshore wind um, and grid solar. Um, on top of that, we've got room for more geothermal. Um, it is cost competitive. There is additional hydro possible, but it's more expensive again, um, and it comes with its own environmental impacts, and, and there's trade-offs between all these different technologies. Um, new gas, coal, or even nuclear typically needs to be at such a scale to be economic that it's too big to suit New Zealand's energy system particularly well, um, and I'm sure Pip and the team and Orion could relate to that. We don't want those big point supply coming onto the system. Um, and so, and nuclear is also increasing in cost in recent years as well. Um, so trend going the wrong way there. So how we use the supply is just important. And that's what's on the right hand side there. The energy system of 2050 is not going to be linear supply demand. It's going to be flexibility, timing of demand, and two big enablers are storage costs. I've got lithium ion batteries as an example there, but across storage technologies, they are becoming cheaper. They're performing better. Um, EVs are also also forecast to grow rapidly. Um, as the total cost of ownership becomes better than conventional vehicles. So that puts a large battery in homes and businesses around the country, which is far beyond anybody's driving needs for you know, the next two or three days, and that gives us options. Combine that with AI and automation, and we can drastically change the way we consume energy. Um, and it can make it much more flexible and dynamic if we can all get together and manage it correctly. Um, but that's, that, those are graphs, that's kind of high level, it's averages, and I think a lot gets lost in that. So we're going to have a quick look at a specific example, which is sort of literally at the coalface. So you saw I mentioned the industrial heat was in the earlier graph, helping build us up to what we're going to have in 2050. Um, if I pull one example out of that is Southland industrial heat. Um, not something we all think about a lot, but something that all of us contribute to in one way or another, and a real material part of New Zealand's emissions. Um, it's playing out right now, so decisions get made every week about these, the life of these boilers at the moment. Um, Southland's got a manufacturing sector that's heavily reliant on coal for industrial heat, primarily dairy and meat. That's 1.2 terawatts of demand. That's thousands of tonnes of coal to you and me. It's thousands of trucks on Southland roads, and it's hundreds of thousands of tonnes of CO2 every year without even counting the carbon emissions from the vehicles. So it's, it's worth looking at. Um, businesses are motivated to decarbonise. They want to make it happen. They're prepared to invest in projects that are actually pretty unattractive financially, a lot of the ones that we're involved in, um, which is pretty surprising when you come from the public and you talk to them and you see they're prepared to make those decisions. Um, the technology is available, so they can do it today. They're not waiting for something to develop. Um, there's electric, there's biomass. Both got their own risks and challenges, and we need both options to turn up if we're going to get to where we want to be. Um, they're also close to renewables, but right now, the market's affected by gas shortages, which, which market around the world isn't at the moment, um, but also by that TY uncertainty that I mentioned that slowed down generation. Um, Meridian's taken a, we've taken a long-term view to this because we can see the graphs that we've just been looking at. We've said, okay, long-term price is lower than it is today, and we've given some of these customers who want to switch out their boilers prices for 10 years at a long-run price. Um, and that, along with the ECA funding that's been available, um, has meant that these projects are literally just getting over the line. And these are big decisions. These are hundreds of thousands of tonnes of carbon emissions either way, sort of on, on a board decision that's heavily debated. Um, that's a really positive result, but it is somewhat artificial for now. So it's effectively Meridian and ECA coming in and subsidising the cost of the transmission and distribution upgrades. Um, to give you an idea of the scale, 
We've got one project in South we've been working with, $25 million project, you know, boiler, everything that goes with it, plus the lines upgrades. The lines upgrades are 16 million of that 25, and that's pretty typical for these large projects. So it's amazing that these are getting done at all um, at the moment. And you could say that's the business's problem, right? You could, but in this case, the project not going ahead has a negative emissions impact for all of us, so that's probably not in our best interest. It's not going to make it happen quicker. Um, and it just highlights that it's not just about supply and demand. Um, it's about that critical infrastructure that's needed for the transition. And this is not um, the Gene Taylor pointing at lines companies or Transpower. It's about saying, hey, this benefits all of us or impacts all of us, so we need to work together and really think about it as critical green infrastructure that needs to be in place if we're going to draw a line from where we are today to where we want to be in 2050. So key takeaways, Southland process heat, maybe something, I don't know if you're like me and you've got a picture of the distribution and transmission network on your bedroom wall at home, but um, it's, it's happening right now. It's a bit hidden from most of us, but it's the canary on the coal mine. So this could equally happen if it's thousands of EVs trying to turn up at the same time or other industrial processes that we create something, an electrical option for. Um, it could be a roadblock we don't have time for, right? Um, so the final, whoa, I'll get there, go back. So the final thing for me is that a lot needs to happen, um, and we shouldn't quibble over which thing first. We should get on with it. Um, climate change and decarb will increase our electricity demand. We're going to make sure generation investment is something that's going to happen, um, and that's and you'll get Meridian and others. You know, we'll we'll come to party if there's money to be made investing in assets, right? And that's that will be ultimately a good thing for the system. Um, fortunately, we've got a real advantage in renewables. Um, and there's some tech that will change the way that we can use this electricity as well, and the timing of the demand will make a huge difference to what we can do. But as the Southland example shows, when the rubber hits the road, it's not just about that headline supply and demand. We're actually going to need to get in there and understand the technical aspects of these projects and make some regional interventions um, if we're going to transition at pace. The ETS will help with that, but I think this example shows is it's not quite there right now because we're still having to push in other ways at the same time. So opportunities there, everyone work together, it's generators, retailers, distributors, government, um, we can work together and get a plan that gives us a bit of certainty and direction. So that's me, thank you. Thank you Brian, I'd like to invite Pip Newland to the stage. Now Pip is the sustainability lead for Orion, so if she has anything on her bedroom wall, maybe it's a map of the distribution network in central Canterbury. <laughs> Somehow I doubt it. <laughs> Pip's going to talk about Orion's climate transition. Uh, kia ora, Michelle. Um, yes, so I'm Pip, I'm the sustainability lead of Orion, uh, and I'd just like to say I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this uh, this event tonight, um, it's obviously a topic we're pretty passionate about at Orion, um, and to be able to kind of join in with today's speakers, is, or tonight's speakers, is a real privilege. So hoping to give you a bit of insight into kind of Orion's operations, and how we're hoping to enable, or help enable that transition to that low carbon economy. Um, so I thought I would give you a quick run through of what we do at Orion. I won't get into too much detail, because you're probably pretty aware of that already. Um, the type of transformation that we're looking at at the distribution level um, and the resources and balance uh, that needs to be achieved in that uh, transition and then a bit of a view of the future at that distribution level. So a quick intro uh, about Orion. So we're the lines company for central Canterbury and we're bounded by the uh, Waimakariri uh, and the Rakaia rivers. Uh, we go up to Arthur's Pass and all around Banks Peninsula. So we cover a pretty big geographic area um, and also cover both ur urban and rural uses. Um, so we take the uh, electricity from Transpower, we transform it into uh, lower voltages and we transport it through our assets uh, to deliver it to your homes and your businesses. So we've got about 204,000 customers or connections at the moment and it's actually growing, it's, we're experiencing unprecedented growth at the moment. Um, but we don't have generation and we're not a retailer. Um, we do show up on your monthly power bill, so we're about 26% of that, and that goes towards maintaining, maintaining and uh, installing and running uh, that critical infrastructure that delivers the electricity to your door. So um, we're also community owned. 
Um, so we're owned by Christchurch City Holdings, uh, who are owned by the City Council and also the Selwyn District Council. Um, and that's a really good thing because it means that our shareholders are also our stakeholders. So it means we've got a really keen sense of responsibility to our community. Um, we're also a lifeline utility. Um, and that means that uh, we feel a sense that we're kind of guardians of our community energy supply. Um, and we do need to be really responsible and prepare for changes in both our physical operating environment and also changes in how our community wishes to use its energy in that transition or how it when it's responding to the climate emergency. So that's reflected in our purpose here. So the, um, and it really is, how can we best support and enable that climate transition? It's kind of what we're all about at the moment. Um, so I was just um, really, I don't know, heartened, enthusiastic about hearing about the collaboration from, from Ryan and also discussion about the fact that it really is both supply and managing demand and starting to think about how we behave and how we engage with energy as a whole. It's just great to hear that because it really does need to be um, a discussion not just about generating constantly more. It does need to be also about managing that demand because uh, in terms of the challenge that we face, we have to ensure that our customers... Let's see if this goes. That way, thank you. Sorry. They receive the right amounts of energy um, of the right quality and also at the right time. So there's a few variables that we've got to manage in that. So it's not just about delivering enough, it's actually about delivering it within a certain uh, voltage window um, and also at the time that you want it. So um, I've probably, uh, I'll draw the analogy with like your friendly neighbourhood delivery person. You don't want to ring up for a pizza and have it arrive two hours late, half eaten and cold. Um, <laughs> you actually want it, you know, hot and piping when you want it. So, and it's the same with us. We need to make sure that you get it when you want to boil a jug, when you want to operate a piece of sensitive equipment, um, when you're running an experiment, when you're running an industrial process, it needs to be there. Um, so traditionally... Um, for us, sorry, I keep pointing that in the wrong direction. Uh, that's actually been pretty uh, relatively simple to manage because we've, we've had a fairly linear system. There's been large-scale generation. It's gone through the transmission network. We've taken it off uh, TransPower, uh, transformed it and delivered it to your home. So as I say, fairly linear, fairly predict predictable, We've had, which has uh, incentivised uh, long-lived assets um, and pretty long planning loops as well. Um, so just to give you some context, some of our assets are up to 80 years old. You know, they, they can be kept for up to 80 years. Um, it's also, uh, I'll probably say there's probably a limited or less incentive for really fast feedback loops to customers to change behaviour. Um, monthly bills are typically enough particularly at a resi residential level for people to kind of see how they're behaving and how that shows up in terms of costs to them. And I think long term what it's really resulted in is a bit of a decoupling of the community from uh, engaging and understanding energy as a resource. Um, it's just there because it's actually been so reliable and just ubiquitous, You never really people don't really think about it as a thing. Um, and that's something that's actually starting to change. So um, what it's transitioning to is a redistributive, horizontally networked, bi-directional energy system. So that sounds a bit fancy, doesn't it? But um, really what it means is that, um, and I'm going to use a motorway analogy here. I don't know if that seems a bit controversial. Let's assume it's all electric cars. But um, before, if you imagine, everyone was travelling in one direction and they all had the same office hours um, and they all drove cars. So um, it was pretty easy to predict, and you built the motorway maybe six lanes wide, and you expected a bit of slowdown at certain times of day, but you know everyone got there in the end. So I don't know, we've had a bit of COVID, um, and uh, people have started working from home. Someone's invented a flying car. We've got some bus services in there. Um, no offices exist anymore, potentially. So that's what we're dealing with here. We've got um, two-way flows of electricity, people uh, generating within the network and wanting to feed it back into the network. You've got um, storage in more locations. You've got electric vehicles. Uh, so increasing um, demands on the network and demands on the network at different times. So it's starting to get pretty interesting. Um, and it results in some sort of transitional impacts for us. Um, EVs are a good example of that. And I thought it was... Um, it's really good to hear Ryan refer to them as kind of a potential future battery source, which is... 
certainly what we're expecting uh, in the long term, or the, the medium to long term, as that technology becomes available. Um, and uh, if you can imagine that typically within the Canterbury region, because we've got pretty cold winters, we are expe experiencing kind of two peak demands, usually morning and, morning and evening, because um, people want to cook their breakfast or heat up their house, and then they come home and they want to cook their dinner and, and heat up their house and watch TV. And so if you imagine that in that evening demand, if everyone plugs their EVs in at the same time, then it's either going to increase demand at that time, so you have a heightened peak, or um, if you actually shift everyone to, say, a night rate, and that night rate starts at 9 o'clock, then you're going to have three peaks. Um, so we need to start thinking about how people are going to want to use their EVs, because that is a big draw in our network, and ensure that our infrastructure is actually ready to service that demand so that people can still have... Uh, their electricity in the right amount at the right time and of the right quality. Um, so that's kind of one of the challenges that we've got. Another one, uh, which is Ryan's also referred to, is that process heat example. So um, for us, uh, I think our peak demand at the moment uh, on the network is about 730 megawatts. So um, what we're looking at is an increase on that. There's about 300 megawatts worth of thermal heat in our region. Um, not all of that will be ele electrical an electrical change. Most of it will probably be biomass, but there will be an electrical component to that. So we need to start planning um, and understanding how that fits in this new picture. Um, there will also be some climate behavioural change um, that we'll need to develop kind of grapple with as we go through. So it's not just about new technology coming in, it's actually also about things like, if we're hotter, people are going to want to cool their houses down, and so the demand might happen at different times to a typical winter peaking load. We might have a summer peak, um, and that's also particularly relevant in the context of, of Canterbury, where we've got irrigation load during summer as well. It starts to, to show up there. Um, and, of course, the things that we also need to plan for are the things that we don't know about. So there's always a bit of tech around the corner. There's lots of development going on. It's all accelerated because of the climate transition. So we're always keeping an eye out for kind of what's, what's the next thing. So um, it's pretty challenging, but it's actually also a really fantastic opportunity because what it's effectively doing, this particular transition, is remapping the entire energy system. Um, and there's heaps of opportunity in there to improve community resilience and actually connect communities with the energy use again um, so that uh, they're actually encouraged to find collaborative solutions, um, encourage innovation, and actually create jobs because we're going to need more uh, capability in different areas uh, than we previously did. So I've just had the chime, so I'm going to whiz through quick. Um, so in this transition, we really need to start to think about finding balance between these three. So this is the energy trilemma. So typically, we have focused a lot um, on reliability and resilience. Um, as we're moving towards achieving a, a lower carbon grid, we also need to make sure that that's affordable for people because that also enables that low carbon transition. If it's too expensive for people to access, they're not going to actually want to use electricity as an option. Um, and I'd say that um, to do that, to achieve this, sorry, we need to make sure that these assets um, are designed and understood uh, in collaboration and with others in the energy system and also with the customer at the centre of that design process. So we're not uh, coming up with a solution and presenting it to our customers in our community. We're actually designing the solution along with them. Um, because in doing that, we're being most efficient with the resources that we actually have. Um, because those resources come at a cost. They come at a cost, a financial cost. They also come at an environmental cost. Um, and that's, that cost is obviously embodied carbon, but it's actually you know, embodied um, embodied water and um, extractive costs, uh, which often will come from overseas. So if we want to be efficient um, with the resources that we're using, we want to get closer to our customers and make sure that we're actually designing it so it suits what they need the first time. Uh, and that will mean, uh, in our context, that we end up with an affordable solution. That's certainly what we're hoping. So I'll just end with that. So thank you.
Thank you very much, Pip. So we're just going to do a little tech switcheroony here um, to get Paul Fuge on the line. So kia ora, everybody. My name's uh, Paul Fuge, and I am the manager of uh, Consumer New Zealand's Power Switch service. Um, so Power Switch is a free and independent price comparison website that allows electricity consumers to find out if they're on the best electricity plan for them. It's been a service for around 20 years now. We've been, uh, consumers have been providing that. So I've been asked to talk to you today uh, about electricity prices and how this relates to societal and environmental trends and impacts, specifically inequality, energy consumption, and the uptake of solar and energy efficiency. So a good place to start would be uh, electricity prices themselves, because this underpins a lot of the trends around these things. So a good place to start with electricity prices are the reforms of the 1990s, most notably the Electricity, Refor Electricity Industry Reform Act of 1998, which split the ownership of lines and energy and enabled the electricity retail market as we know it today. Now, these reforms constituted a significant change for New Zealand's. Um, the benefits of reforms championed at the time were that they would result in a better deal for consumers through greater competition, which would result in lower prices. So it's been around 20 years since those reforms happened, just slightly more. So in the 20 years that's happened since, let's have a look at what's, what's happened. So in the 20 years since the reforms, since 1990 reforms, um, we certainly have more choice. That has definitely happened. In 2004, there were less than 10 electricity retailers. Today, there are around 30 operating. However, this is quite concentrated uh, competition. Most consumers are still with the big five retailers. Only 16% of consumers are with small and medium retailers. So it's true we have greater choice, but we, what we see is the market is still uh, concentrated with the original um, retailers. However, although competition did, re did increase in that period, prices also rose sharply, as you can see from this graph. In real terms, domestic electricity prices are close to 50% higher than they were at the time of re the reforms. We did see increasing competition in the sort of, sort of 2016 onwards um, with new players such as Flick and Electric Kiwi who came in with more innovative, innovative retail type offerings. And this did seem to result in a leveling off of price increases and prices didn't, didn't, didn't did indeed decrease slightly from 2016. However, more recently, we've seen quite a lot of volatility in the wholesale market. And we've seen some of those smaller players actually drop out of the market or curtail taking on new customers. And we have seen very recently prices start to increase again. The average price is now slightly above 30, 30 cents. The rapid rise in prices have obviously not been great for consumers. And feedback we get at Consumer New Zealand is many consumers feel a bit um, let down by the industry and have a bit misled about those, the outcomes of the reforms. This is unfortunate. But for most consumers, this won't come as a surprise. After all, when you open your power bill in winter, you see the, the effect of these price rises. However, what might shock a lot of people is how much the price of electricity can change across New Zealand. Now, if we look at some analysis that Consumer New Zealand has done more recently, what you can see here is that what we're trying to show here is the um, differences in prices across the country. So what we see here is the highest prices, and those, those are represented by these circles with the, with the percentage increases. So if you look, for example, at Kiri Kiri, for example, that has a, has a price that's 36% higher than the national average price. In Gisborne, for example, you can see the price is 13% higher than the national average. In Wellington, the average price is 6% lower than the national average. Now, what's interesting here as well is the places with the highest prices also tend to have the lowest incomes. And then that's very unfortunate. So what's happening there is it's exacerbating uh, what we call um, energy poverty. So the places with the least incomes are facing the highest prices. Now, this can be considerable. The price in Kerikiri, for example, is around 40% higher than down the road in Auckland, 
where incomes are 24% higher. The representative price in Westport, which has lower than average incomes, is 28% higher than in Christchurch, which on average has higher incomes. So these high electricity costs in low income areas are contributing to our high rates of energy hardship. The electricity price review estimated that there are currently around 175,000 households facing energy hardship and children are overrepresented in these households. Consumer New Zealand does a, an annual survey of electricity consumers and we found that energy costs are a major concern for 26% of New Zealand households and 18% of New Zealand households are having trouble paying their power bills. 13% of households worryingly indicated that they have to cut back on heating due to cost concerns. Now this has real world consequences. Cold houses are a health risk, particularly respir respiratory health with vulnerable customers such as children and older people. These are our most susceptible consumers and they're facing some of the coldest houses. Respiratory diseases in New Zealand cost more than $7 billion every year and account for one in 10 hospital stays. And people living in deprived households are admitted to hospital for respiratory illness at three times the rate of those more well off. The overall effect um, of high prices, conversely, is that it makes energy conservation and solar more attractive. So while it's bad on one hand for uh, energy poverty and people in hardship, the counterfactual to that is it also creates incentives for um, solar and energy efficiency. So household consumption has actually been dropping in New Zealand for various reasons. Appliances have got more efficient. Um, on average, houses across New Zealand are starting to get slightly better. The average is now uh, just under, just over 7,000 kilowatt hours per, per annum down 10% from a peak of around 8,000 kilowatt hours in the 1990s. That's, that's a good news story. Um, another thing we wonder about there is the effect of climate change on that is the weather's got warmer, um, of course, heating, heating reduces. What we worry about there is as the weather gets warmer, the uh, air conditioning load will actually increase. So we'll switch from being um, a heating to a cooling as other countries uh, do. So household appliances, households, houses and appliances have got more efficient. For example, um, efficiency of improvements mean a typical fridge today uses around 35% less electricity than a comparable fridge around 20 years ago. So the cost of running a new fridge is around $70 per annum cheaper than 20 years ago. That is assuming you can afford to buy a new fridge, which many households can't. Um, and also the high domestic prices combined with the reduction in the cost of solar PV system. PV systems makes the most domestic solar increasingly attractive. So the price of solar systems has dr dropped rapidly. In 2009, the average price for a three kilowatt household system was around $40,000. That same system today would be around $10,000. So these price reductions uh, of the PV systems is fueling a rapid uptake in New Zealand. Across New Zealand, there are now around, there's now around, around 160 megawatts of solar um, capacity installed and 60 megawatts of the 160 megawatts was installed in the last two years. That's a rem remarkably rapid uptake we're seeing in solar. We think this is a great thing. However, the benefits of these efficiency gains are not spread evenly across consumers. Lower income households are of course much um, more likely to have older, less efficient appliances and live in poor and housing stock. And of course, lower income houses are less able to be able to invest in more efficient appliances and of course, solar PV. So the outcome of all this is the wealthy households can shield themselves from increasing prices while the less well off can, cannot. And this is contributing to the inequality across society, which I think is bad for New Zealand as a whole. So let's look, have a quick look at the, the, what's gonna happen next. So we believe these trends are likely to continue uh, and household prices will rise if uh, they follow the, the wholesale price trend. So the graph I'm showing you there is, is um, the wholesale electricity prices over time uh, and the annual average of those prices. And you can, as you can see, that those are increasing. So over the last year, we've seen a large increase in the average wholesale price and an increasingly volatility of, of prices. We believe, it's, we believe it's only a matter of time before we see these higher prices and volatility reflected in domestic electricity prices 
as existing hedges run out and new ones have to be negotiated at higher prices. We've already seen some of the lower cost retailers curtail taking on new customers or disappear from the market completely. Trustpower, one of the largest retailers, is getting out of retailing altogether. All this means is there's less competition and what that means is there's less um, ability to keep a lid on prices through competitive pressure. But high prices will both increase the incentive for energy and increasingly make solar viable for increasing numbers of households. There's other factors also at play which make solar more viable. These are, there's more people working from home because of the COVID um, situation, which we think will continue as, as more people have got used to working from home and this will likely continue. With people working from home, they're using electricity during the day, which, which is good for, sol for solar use. More EVs. EVs work well with solar. If you can plug in your EV during the day when it's sunny, making it more um, economically viable. The prices of batteries will start, will continue to reduce. This makes solar more viable as well because you can store the electricity um, generated during the day and use it at night. This improves the economics of solar systems. Smart meters and other rule changes will allow things like multiple trading relationships uh, and increase the buyback rates we're seeing for solar. So currently solar, the buyback rates are between nine and 15 cents, whereas, whereas most consumers are buying at around 30 cents. With the advent of rule changes, which allow you to sell your uh, solar generation to a different, purse, different um, organization than you buy electricity from, which mean, will mean you be able to sell your electric, solar electricity at a higher rate than you do now. This will make the economics of solar much, much, much better. However, this also exacerbates energy hardship and inequality with more households being left behind. So how do we encourage conservation, energy efficiency and solar uptake while helping our most vulnerable households? We believe a solution would be to better target the winter energy payment to those most in need. The winter energy payment runs from the start of July to the end of September each year. And during this period, Single people get around $20 per week and couples $32 per week. Around 850,000 people are eligible to get the wind energy. The total spend is around $270 million per year. We believe the payment is spread over too many recipients to make a material difference to those that need it the most. The winter energy payment would cover the entire annual power bill of around 120,000 households, which is close to the same number of low income households. We're not advocating this occurs, just illustrating that better targeting of existing funding has the potential to make a material impact on energy hardship. In the longer term, we think the government should also look at the market stru industry structure and the market structure and mechanisms to make sure they continue to be fit for purpose and are delivering for consumers. So I hope that's been um, informative and useful. I always pitch that, pe that people should um, always check their Powerball and go onto our free service, PowerSwitch, and um, check that they're not paying more than they should for electricity. We find that on average, currently uh, most households are saving $150 per annum just by switching uh, energy provider. So thanks for your time. Um, hope that's been useful. So, Thank you, Paul, very much. Not that you can hear me. Um, so I, so we've all got very used to Zoom, and one of the things is we've actually also got very used to the vagaries of Zoom. So I will apologise for the vagaries of Zoom and the fact that we could not see any of Paul's slides. We will try and make them available to everyone um, because the map that he has, especially of the different average power price in different regions is something that I think, well, it certainly made me gasp. Uh, I'd now like to invite Chris Marden to the stage. Chris is Managing Director of EcoBulb. He's going to talk about lessons from their work with families in energy hardship. Uh, he is indeed the current age group world cross-country cha cross champion, so I'm surprised you didn't get to this podium faster. <laughs> um, and Chris has props. I have props indeed. I'm not terribly thrilled with Ryan though, having run on the Port Hills today where it's blowing a gale and I'm getting older and slower, your silver lining about more wind in the future? I'm not so sure. Anyway, thank you very much. 
And I'd like to start tonight with a really big number. One billion dollars. One billion dollars per year is what New Zealand homes can save on their energy bills by doing low-cost, easy energy-saving stuff. Energy, any, easy energy-saving stuff, such as changing out your inefficient light bulbs with LEDs. Jan, thanks for that. That we plugged before. Easy energy-saving stuff, such as replacing your inefficient shower heads with efficient shower heads. Easy energy-saving stuff is just by using your heat pump more efficiently. And Paul's just finished up. Easy energy-saving stuff by going to Consumer New Zealand's wonderful power switch tool and finding the cheapest, lowest cost electricity plan for your home. So, bearing that in mind, we were delighted back in April this year to receive $150,000 of funding from the government, thank you Minister, to go ahead and do exactly this for King Country Homes and Energy Hardship through MB's SEEK funding. So, along with government funding, we had the same amount of funding from the King Country Electric Power Trust, and we worked with the local Murray Health organisations up there, Tuwhatua Health in Turangi, and Kōkuri in, tu in Taumanui, and they provided us with 15 energy assessors. And what we did with our energy assessors is they went into people's homes, and they undertook energy assessments, comprehensive assessments where they'd work through their home, and I know you can't see that, it's all closed up now, looking at where the potential energy savings were for their homes. Now, all of this was free for homes, by the way. At the finish, we filled out a detailed, customised plan for each home that showed the actual dollar savings for each of those energy saving actions. And the response we got from the King Country was staggering. In just four months, 1,522 homes had energy assessments. From a King Country perspective, that's one home in four, in just four months. We distributed 28,000 ecobulb LEDs, 720 shower heads, and we calculate by the finish, the average home is saving $552 per year on their power bills. That's about a quarter of their power bill. We calculate for the whole region, that's about $841,000 per year for the King Country, for those homes that participated. So thank you, Minister. There's 1,522 homes who are materially better off because of this. And I'd like to go back to that really big number. If every single home in New Zealand did what we did in the King Country, we would save New Zealand homes bang on $1 billion per year on their power bills. $1 billion. I wouldn't mind maybe 10% of that. <laughs> the, even just replacing the 30 million inefficient light bulbs in those homes would have the same wonderful climate change benefits as taking all the petrol powered cars off the road in Christchurch and replacing them with electric vehicles. So, thank you very much, and feel free to take home your free eco bulb. And I'll remove our props. Thanks. Chris, stay where you are. I'd, I'd now like to welcome all our Christchurch speakers to the stage for a conversation. So um, while we rearrange the stage, please take note of the phone number that is on the screen now. Uh, we have had already some very interesting questions. Thank you so much for anybody who has texted in a question. And feel free to keep... Um, those questions coming as we go through our conversation. Also, if you are on the live stream at the moment, uh, just pop your questions into the comments section. I have a question to set the scene, though, and I'm going to ask it first of Jan, but then invite the other speakers to chime in. What are the game changers in this game? What's really going to make the difference at pace, as Ryan says? Well, um, close TY and send the electricity north. I understand um, most of the tr transmission capacity is already in place. Um, but, you know, rather than having all these ideas of what to use this huge amount of electricity for, we send it north. Um, it would make a big difference. I think Onslow would make a big difference, but that's begin to be seen. I think um, 
Electric cars are actually game changers because they are putting pressure. They're going to put increasing pressure on the system and it means you know, it, things are going to have to change and think about how they're going to cope with the charging of electric cars. And of course, electric bikes are a game changer for biking. Mm -hmm. um, I think other people can <laughs> yeah. weigh in now. Yeah. Ryan, is closed TY a game changer as far as Meridian is concerned? Do you want a date that doesn't move again? <laughs> it, certainly, it certainly made life easier day to day at Meridian, knowing knowing what the outcome was there. Um, but I think I think Jan's right. Um, I spend a bit of time working on process heat and boilers in Southland, as you saw earlier in particular. And we often sort of half jokingly say that if TY goes, it would be that years later we'll be awarding them prizes for services to decarbonisation in New Zealand because it will accelerate other uses of electricity, you know, it'll, it'll bring prices down and you'll see things like boilers convert more quickly than they would have. Mm. So um, not being someone who's got any control on whether they stay or leave, it'll certainly be a game changer if they go. Um, I think it's worth considering too though that if they do go, those emissions will likely take place somewhere else overseas as well. You know, that, that right. aluminium will get made in China and it'll get made from coal. So. Um, Personally, it would make my day-to-day -day easier if I knew they were going, but I know that that doesn't necessarily have the best outcome. And, and in the scheme of what we need to do by 2050 in terms of the generation, it's actually not as big as it sounds to us right now. So I think we'd cope either way, and we'll still get we'll still get the right things the right things done. Pat, from Orion's point of view, as a lines company, mm. what are the game changers for you? Um. Yeah, well, I'm actually going to say if EVs re reach price parity with a, with a petrol equivalent, um, I think that'll be an interesting one for us um, and because it will drive that pace at change in terms of change on our network um, and how quickly we need to adapt to it. Um, so the Climate Change Commission said that ideally they'd like no new internal combustion engine light vehicles sold in New Zealand mm. by 2030. They mm. said 2035 was the outside, but 2030 was ideal. Mm. Will you cope? Yes. Yeah, well, we're pretty well set in the Canterbury region because we've had winter peaking uh, and we've had a shift from uh, uh, fuel uh, heating to electric heating uh, and we've also the earthquake repairs, so we've got a pretty robust network, and we certainly have been modelling what EV uptake will look like. Um, in saying that, uh, the the behaviour change uh, in getting to grips with how you manage load associated with EVs on a network, uh, and also the business and innovation opportunities associated with that type of management, because it's a whole kind of new flexibility service that potentially could become available um, will yeah, just change the distribution network, I think, and, and how, we, how we perceive it. Um, particularly if vehicle to grid comes along quickly as well, that will start to get really interesting. Hopefully there will be a question about that. Yeah. But let's just um, finish off with Chris. What about you? I was hoping you are going to bypass me on that question, <laughs> but never mind. I actually think if we're sitting back here in 10 years' time, I'm a real optimist. I think we're going to be sitting here with a much more renewable grid, supplying a whole heap of electricity. Low carbon grid. Low, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I think we're going to have a much, ho much lower carbon, much more electricity used grid in 10 years' time. We'll see a very high uptake of EVs. Mm. And I think we'll be, with, given the way everything's going from a price point of view, electric vehicles, solar, the very large resource that we have from a wind and solar and everything else we've got, I think in 10 years' time, we're going to be very pleased with the progress made in the last 10 years. I think we're going to be stunned, actually. So. We've got a question. I know we have. We've got lots of questions. Yeah. Um, the first one, though, for Ryan, is a basic one, um, but really important. In one of your graphs about new generation, uh, one of the types of generation was thermal. Could you please explain what thermal energy is? Yep. So amongst a few things, it's gas and coal. Um, those those were actually just part of that graph. They're not included in the number that I mentioned too in terms of the renewable options. They're, I think I mentioned it earlier, they're really unlikely to be built, just the, the economics and the scale they have to be built at to make sense in New Zealand, not to mention the carbon emissions that come with it um, mean that they're probably really unlikely to, to turn up. Yep. Thank you. 
Thank you. Have you got another one? Right, I've got plenty. They are flowing in um, hot and fast. Um, one more. Uh, more for Ryan, uh, but others may be able to answer it. Given New Zealand's untapped wind resource is 18,000 megawatts, what does he see as the major barriers to a potential massive wind overbuild to get carbon zero electricity well before 2050? Well, I won't pretend I'm a wind expert to, be, to begin with. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm, not, I'm not really, really close to that, so I'd be, I'd be speculating. I know that the consenting side is, has definitely been an issue where technology changes within the life of a consent. So things like the length of blades, you know, and the life of the consent changes and needs to be reconsented, and that's that's certainly things I know have been a have been a challenge. But um, obviously, there's some environmental considerations to build that amount of wind. Um, but no, you'd have, you'd have to get somebody uh, with a bit more wind knowledge to come back to you on that one. Could I make a comment? Yeah. Um, in such a situation, storage becomes even more important mm. because mm. there are days when there is no wind anywhere in the country. Mm. So yeah. mm. it's mm. intermittent. Mm. Yeah. Perhaps this is a good time to ask everyone a question that Jan, you posed. You said, Did I? what do we do <laughs> to make the wholesale electricity market better at taking us to zero carbon? What do we do? Because one of the issues has been that we have had consented wind schemes sitting on the books and sitting on the books and sitting on the books, and the market has not been able to deliver those schemes. So, maybe. But that's not the market so much. That's yeah. the, the RMA. Okay. So, you, so, would you like to explain a little bit more about why the Resource Management Act has been such an encumbrance? Well, just just as I, as I said before, um, we'll take, take wind farms for an example. Um, they're very much in your face if you live in that area, a certain area, and people do object to them very vociferously. Mm. Um, I've never really quite understood it. I can sort of understand if you're right there, living right there, but they seem to be one of the few, mm. if only the only <laughs> uh, kind of um, generation which does not leave any permanent yeah. uh, footprint. So you can, t if we have, if we someday have some miracle form of energy like cold f fusion, um, then you can take them away and nothing changes, mm -hmm. which is rare. But anyway, the point is you do get lots of objections. And this holds things up because of the processes we go through under the RMA. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying we want to, you know, some of those processes are important, but, but David Parker, you're, you're changing the RMA at the moment. Please bear in mind we're going to have to build a whole lot more wind and other things. Mm -hmm. So the price of wind has come right down, hasn't it, Ryan? Because at one, at one stage we have had projects that have gone all the way through their consent and still haven't been built. Do you expect wind farms to be built more quickly in the future? Well, Meridian's recently announced building water. I, th I think it's going to be the largest in, in Hawke's Bay, um, which is a which is a positive sign, but actually it's a bit of an outlier in the last five or ten years where we've had that uncertainty from TY where even with the price dropping, at times the the market on the ASX is, has still been below the cost of wind or below the cost of that generation. So mm -hmm. I think that naturally, it doesn't necessarily stop it dead in its tracks at a point in time, which Harapaki kind of shows, where you've got players that will take a long-term position and you've got others looking at solar in the same way. They're taking a longer-term view. But I don't think you could say that it hasn't slowed it down significantly, you know, knowing that there's going to be this huge amount of demand disappear from a market, sort of naturally everyone else, everyone looks at everyone else and who's going first and we don't all want to turn up at the same time is, is a natural way that it, that it plays out. Mm. Jessica? Um, we have a, quest, a question specifically for Chris. How did you get buy-in from the community, especially from hard to reach low decile homes? And the second part of the question is, does your software help get behaviour change? Two very good questions. The key was partnering up with local people in the areas, the local Murray Health organisations, and finding people who knew the local people. So literally, the aim was to find someone who knew someone who knew someone and who could relate to those. So that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question, 
we focus behavioural change is important. What we were trying to do is do stuff we could lock in before we left the home. Mm. So by changing the light bulbs, locked in. Install an efficient shower head, it's locked in. Mm. Clean their heat pump filters for them, locked in. Help them switch to a new electricity plan that's cheaper, all locked in stuff. And my favourite, and it was quite common, is a lot of second, really old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old fridges with one or two drinks or a bit of food in there that had been a source of confusion and argument for years. When we could show them, pull it out, put it in the main fridge, turn it off, a $200 year saving. So we were focused on doing stuff that we could leave knowing that saving was already done. And the behavioural staying stuff afterwards, that was nice. We already knew we'd done a decent job before we left. Chris, you did actually also get some insights into um, the, the reality of working with people who are really in hardship. And, yeah, and yeah. would you like to tell us a little bit about Facebook Live and, and yeah. how you got around people's reticence to let you into their homes? All right, so what, that's a really good question. And one of those things we learned in the project, it turns out that in those sort of areas where it's low energy, high energy hardship, only about four in 10 people will let you into their home to do energy assessment. So the other six out of 10, you've got to find ways to bring them to you because they just don't want you in their home for whatever reason. So we started running expos using our software tools. We could do all the assessment. They could bring in the information, do it there. And then there was still a whack of people who would still not be able to come in, who couldn't physically travel. And COVID and the lockdown actually helped us out because we had 150 assessments to go. And then level four lockdown. So our teams in both Tamanu and Turangin found ways where they could use social, social messaging and messenger to actually put all the information to the, the people in those homes. They would send the information back and we'd do the assessment remotely and deliver the bulbs and the shower heads and everything else afterwards. So we found a way we could pretty well reach everyone by doing that. Another question via text. What should local and regional councils do to support New Zealand's energy transition? Wow. Who wants to have a go at that? Yeah. Not me. I've spoken too much. <laughs> Pip, you're first. <laughs> Good times. Um, yeah, I think um, in strategic... Uh, transition planning, and I'm thinking the first thing that popped into my head was regional transport planning, um, that they're actually involving uh, electricity distributors and uh, retailers and involving electricity companies in that conversation. Um, so uh, that those, that the energy system isn't playing catch up, particularly since the transport system is transitioning to, you're gonna have an electrified model. Um, maybe not for 100% of it, but certainly for the, the vast majority of it, that's actually part of the planning process rather than an end kind of solution being presented with it. Yeah, we're included in the conversation as it, as it progresses. I'd say that, that's kind of top of mind. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone want to add to that, Ryan? I think these sort of events are a big part of it as well mm. because just the role that local bodies can play in have, getting the conversation going like we're having tonight mm. um, and getting people together to talk about it makes I think it makes a difference to set things up to, to be received more quickly and technology mm. to be taken up more quickly and more cycle lanes because I've knocked off my bike too many times lately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think transport is the big one. Yeah. Uh, but one of the odd things, of course, is that we've left with um, regional councils in charge of buses and local councils in charge of the infrastructure that support mm. bus networks. So there's sort of it's an oddity that uh, mm. one thing yeah. that could be uh, looked at seriously. It's gone on for a long time. Mm. I'd, I'd be really interested to see this talk about free buses in Christchurch. I think it could be a really interesting experiment because... I'm sure the subsidy is huge, and free buses might not mean much more. <laughs> don't know. Don't know the numbers. Yeah. I'm going to um, ask the H question. Hydrogen. What potential do you see in hydrogen? Ryan? I thought, I thought I the most thought, qualified person goes first. I thought, um, <laughs> <laughs> that Meridian expressed some interest in hydrogen as something that could be uh, produced at TY, as TY went? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's one of those things, like we've talked about Onzo a little bit 
tonight is that it's absolutely worth having a look at, you know, and that's, that's what we're doing at the moment. Um, together with Contact, we've done a study um, on what hydrogen looks like. And I think we've probably been more and more interested the more we've looked at it, it's probably fair to say. It's so to look better and better, especially when you start to understand the benefits around demand flexibility, which has been mentioned a lot tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about the effect of um, a TY-like business and demand on the market and that chilling of investment, mm -hmm. um, you've got one company that's threatening to leave and go overseas all the time versus a, a business that would be in New Zealand, employing New Zealanders, mm -hmm. making the most of the low carbon resources we've got in New Zealand, um, and also bringing some flexibility to the market. So there's an opportunity for hydrogen production to be switched on and off, you know, to mm -hmm. suit that seasonality and intraday pricing and, and help try and, re and ultimately that can reduce the cost of running the whole system for end users, um, which could be a really good thing. <coughs> um, I'm, a, yeah. I'm much more sceptical about it. Yeah. Um, I think it seems fairly clear that, say, Japan and South Korea, because of their dependence on coal and imported LNG and things like that, yeah. um, are going to have to go pretty much towards hydrogen economies if they're to make gains in getting rid of carbon. Yeah. But here I'm, I'm blown if I can see why we would use electrolysis to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Then we've got the problem of storing the hydrogen, compressing it, changing it to ammonia, blah, 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 blah. There's inefficiencies all the way down the line. Yeah. And um, I just don't see where there's much in it for us. Yeah. It's worth thinking about. I think Onslow is yeah. worth thinking about more. I think, I think that's... And, and, yeah. and, and hydrogen would be a bad fuel for gas power plants, I believe, from none other than Keith Turner. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I think it's in that. It's in the, it's in the, worth, it's in the worth looking at category. Yeah. You know, that's all, anywhere it is for now. Correct. Yeah, hydrogen, I understand the conversation around that. What we've got to bear in mind, and you go back to Ryan's graph up there earlier about all the growth we're going to see for electric vehicles, for decarbonising industri decarbonizing industry, et cetera, et cetera. We have all that resource available to us right now from the stuff we've got, wind, solar, and the focus has got to be on utilising that because that delivers what we need. Mm -hmm. yep. So thank you very much, and we have run out of time. So I'd like to thank all the speakers very much. Um, I'm sorry we can't address all the questions. We will pick up as many as possible in our energy newsletter, which will come out uh, in the next week or so to registered participants. If you're not registered, but you want to get the newsletter, just go to teputahi.org.nz and sign up, please. So if I could ask our panellists to leave the stage, we will do a bit of a shimmy. <laughs> So it's time for the lectern to move back on, miraculously, as I stand down the front and do a song and dance act. And we're delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Megan Woods, who's the Minister of Energy and Resources. Not only that, she's Christchurch, and we love her for it. So MP for Wigram as well. And we've invited her to give us a response to the issues in the spirit of a Christchurch conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, kia ora koutou, everybody, and thank you uh, for having me along tonight. It's been a really fascinating conversation. This is the third night in a row that I've been involved in an energy conversation. Um, it's Wednesday today, isn't it? Yes. Monday night was an energy ministerial on hydrogen. Um, and I have to say in response to that, it's not a question of if it's going to happen, it's a question of whether or not New Zealand's going to be left out. Um, that it is happening around the world, and I think there is huge potential for New Zealand, not only domestically, but actually as an export industry as well. So I think that is a conversation that is moving rapidly. It has moved hugely even in the last 12 months. Last night was with the World Energy Council. Um, this is the first night in front of humans. The others were from my kitchen table via Zoom, so it's good to be here. And one of the things that I took from, from the panel that I was on with the World Energy Council um, session I was in was Angela Wilkinson, who's the Secretary General of that organisation, talked about humanising energy. And I think that's something that came through very strongly tonight. And Pip, you said it, you talked about a decoupling of community and energy that has happened over a, a series of decades in New Zealand. And I think our future is very much about that recoupling 
of communities and energy. Um, and thank you uh, for the light bulb moment. It's wonderful to be here. Just like to tell you, the 30 million light bulbs that we need to change, I did my bit door knocking yesterday. I went door knocking with Anglican Care and Hill Morton um, to change out some light bulbs because I think that's what a Minister of Energy should do, um, that it needs to happen one household at a time. It needs to put the community back into energy. I say my greatest grounding for being the Minister of Energy is sitting in my electorate office in Rowley in Hoon Hay and seeing people who cannot pay their power bills. And for me, when I'm thinking about energy policy, that is always front and centre of my mind of how it is we do that. The future of energy is about putting this together. It will be decentralised, it will be digitised and it will be decarbonised. And Jan, I take your point that it is about um, um, decarbonisation, and I'd actually say it's not low carbon, it's zero carbon that we have to be shooting for. That, um, co that gas might be half as bad as, uh, half as, you know, for only, coal might be twice as bad as gas, but renewables are 100% better than gas. And I think that as we move that, in terms of the fact that we have to decarbonise, gas is still a fossil fuel, and if we're going to reach our, carbon, our decarbonisation goals, we've got to be looking to a future where we remove fossil fuels from, from the mix. And that's the pathway we need to be on. I absolutely take the point around the, the energy-electricity dichotomy. And I think that's something that get, people get caught up in too much. In order to decarbonise our energy system or our electricity system, we have to address the issue of storage here in New Zealand. And that's something that's come up through a number of the speakers um, and something that we know that we have to put a lot of effort into. The, the, I think a lot about what the role of government is in this journey and what our role here. It is as a, as a regulator and a policy maker. And um, in terms of the RMA reforms, um, one of the things that I sit in that ministerial oversight group, not just as the Minister of Housing, but also as the Minister of Energy, because you're absolutely right, we have to be thinking how we enable the renewable generation, or sorry, the decarbonised generation that we're going to need into our future. And I actually do have some hope around that. If I think about the way in which people have come together to have a very mature and growing up conversation about Onslow, that I've been working very closely with our envir environmental NGOs um, around this and having a conversation with them. We had Greenpeace that have come out and supported, supported it because they see that the storage is absolutely critical in terms of, the, of carbon reduction. Uh, we've got to take account of the ecological consideration of any sch scheme of this size, but I think that we're in for a very mature and growing up conversation around some of, some of um, these issues. I have put the challenge to a number of our environmental NGOs when I first became Minister of Energy that we cannot have a green movement and an environmental movement that stands in the way of us putting in place renewable energy projects. And they are absolutely up and on board for that conversation. But we do have to make sure we're doing this in ecologically sound and sustainable ways as well. Our job is also leadership. And it is about making sure that we are setting the, the country on a path that says we do have to decarbonise, we do have emissions reduction plans, and I really want to acknowledge the work that the Interim Climate Commission and then the Climate Commission have done in terms of the carbon budgeting really will sharpen the focus around getting into the detail of what those emissions reduction plans need to look like. We need investment. So one of the schemes that I'm really, really excited about that we've put in place um, through the government's um, conserva Energy Conservation Authority, ECA, is GIDI the government investment in decarbonisation, decarbonising industry, and I think that's what you were referring to. Some of the, the first two rounds of the scheme that we've funded out of this have done something like 17% of the carbon reductions that we'll see out, have to see out of the first budget. Um, and this is, it's phenomenal. There's some very low hanging fruit here in the South Island with, um, with, with coal um, and industrial and process heat. Some of the costs are of abatement are so low that it's caused 
colleagues to question, well, why is government funding this? But I think it is actually about that leadership and showing that we're walking alongside um, industry in this decarbonisation pathway. And I know that a number of our energy companies are also doing this. So when it comes to those discussions at the board level, that uh, there they can say that they're not in this alone, that government has a stake in this too. Also, ECA, I think one of the things when I became the, Ministry of en the Minister of Energy, that ECA became such an important part of that puzzle of what we need to achieve. Because, of course, um, energy efficiency does mean lower costs, whether that's for industry or whether it's for households. So thank you for the work that you've done in the King Country. Um, one of, and it's work that we need to replicate around the country because we have to make sure that we are looking at this. I absolutely agree with the assessment that's been made tonight around the uncertainty of TY, the TY cloud, around um, about investment. It is something that has been hanging over for the last couple of years. I would argue that it's had a far bigger impact than anything to do with resource consents. We made an offer to a number of the generators when we first came into government. If there genuinely is issues with the re resource consent, tell us exactly where they are and we're willing to see what we can do to do a fast track fix for them. But the issue really was the uncertainty about what was going to happen around TY. So um, we, we have been resolute in our position as government that it is our job for us to be planning with the people for, of Southland for a future that is beyond TY, um, that we have to make sure that we are putting in place plans for good, well-paid jobs and the reskilling that will be required for the workforce down there. We also have to embrace new ways, and new ways right across the board, if we're going to think about this humanised um, energy um, of the future. That it, one of the um, things that I think is happening right before our eyes, and I'm absolutely fascinated about, is the innovation that's happening at a market level that we're watching, with PPAs uh, becoming more, power purchase agreements becoming more and more common which will be a way, rather than individual unit pricing, that a new generation will be paid for. And I think there's some innovative community approaches that we could take to that as well. Um, I think that distribution companies are the next frontier of doing some really cool stuff, and I know Orion is doing a lot, so thank you for that. I'm also really excited about um, Vector's um, partnership with X, formerly um, Google X, but the Moonshot Factory, for the network visualisation, simulation that they've been chosen to be part of. I think that this is going to change the way we think about distribution, real-time pricing, demand management. When the lights went out on the 9th of August, it wasn't because we had, didn't have enough generation in New Zealand. There are a number of factors. One of them is that we have a number of, of distribution companies now in New Zealand that don't have ripple control. Um, just the ability to reach in and do that kind of level of demand side management during a winter peak. I grew up, and I'm sure many of the people in this room just taking it as a given, that on a cold winter's night, the water heating might be cut for an hour or two. Um, that, but some of our distribution companies simply don't have the ability to do that now. So we have to think about this. I think we also need to think about our EVs not just as a drain, but also as a mass network storage system when they're all plugged in and networked. And ECA's funding some trials through that. After the August 9th um, events, the EVs were seen by some as the bogey, the thing that had caused this, the strain they'd put on the grid. I asked for some advice pretty quickly. Give me an assessment roughly. If every EV in the country that is here now was plugged in on the night of August the 9th, give me an equivalent. It's Mosgiel. So EVs were not the problem any more than Mosgiel caused the lights to go out on the 9th of August. We do have the wherewithal, if we use technology smartly, that we're investing in the, in the generation to do it. But I think one of the things is we do have to think about um, how we're going to cope within our distribution and transmission systems with ultra-fast charging networks. That's where the real strain will come on our network, not people plugging in their EVs at home, but where we have super-fast chargers down State Highway 1. That's the bit that really keeps me up at night. But I think that there are lots of opportunities for us, but these are not going to magically happen. That we do have to make sure that we have community leadership, that we have government leadership, both at a local government and a central government um, level. We've got to make sure that we are balancing the need for decarbonising, but also 
keeping our eye on the fact that we need to have affordability as a central pillar of any energy system. Thank you. Namahi Nui, thank you, Minister Woods. Uh, we very much appreciate you making time to be with us this evening to make a response to the conversation. And thank you so much to all our other speakers who have generated this fascinating discussion on this most important aspect of climate action in Aotearoa. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, but it's also been incredibly rich and complex. So thank you so much to Dr. Jan Wright, to Ryan Kugelein, to Pip Newland, to Paul Fuge and Chris Marden. And thank you all uh, to you for joining us tonight and for your incredible engagement, whether in the room or online. We invite you to think about the change that has been discussed and how you could be involved, whether as users of energy, as potential generators of energy, as voters and as submitters, as decision makers in our homes and businesses and as members of our communities, what part do you have to play in reducing the emissions from the energy sector? As has been discussed tonight, we note that the topics um, we are exploring in Christchurch Conversations towards 2030 series are not divisible. Building and construction, land use and transport in particular are closely intertwined with energy. To this end, we invite you to join us at either or both of the final two events in this year's series, which will be a bumper weekend to finish uh, this 2021 series over the 6th and 7th of November. On the 6th of November, we have an event called 15 Minute Neighbourhoods, and on the 7th of November, uh, that most important topic, transport, which we've rescheduled from earlier in the year, moving around a 21st century city on Sunday the 7th of November. Both will be held in Tūranga and also live streamed as we've, as we've designed them for the current Alert Level 2 requirements. Both have interactive aspects and we are hoping to give you op opportunities to participate in these conversations in new ways if we can. We also invite you to watch the earlier Christchurch Conversations events on our YouTube channel. Building for the Future in particular addresses questions of energy efficiency in our buildings relevant to tonight's conversation. Finally, I would like to thank again our sponsors and supporters, our series partner, Christchurch City Council, our series sponsor, the It's Time Canterbury Climate Campaign, and please don't forget to fill in and leave us your It's Time Canterbury cards, um, and our research partner, the Huritanga thread of building better homes, towns and cities, one of the national science challenges. So please, go well into the spring night. Ka kite anō.